This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. Honey Badger has your back when it counts. They're the only air tracker that combines air monitoring, uptime monitoring, and cron monitoring into a single and simple to use platform. Their mission is to tame production and make you a better, more productive developer. In this episode, we're going to have a look at errors in our application, and more specifically, having a monitor where we can see where those errors are going. And as a disclaimer, I'm not encouraging you to go out and create your own error tracker and monitoring system. Instead, I think it's a pretty cool proof of concept that we're going to be able to use to then be able to apply in other situations. And hopefully you might have a few of those kind of situations where you could benefit from doing something like this. So as we can see, we have an error on the page and it's occurring in the controller. And with this controller, we have a user's find and this is getting caught. We get the error, we see it on the screen. In a normal situation, in a production environment, you would be routed to an error 500 page. And then we can come over to a separate application that I have running where we are then tracking the errors. We can click on one of the errors and get some more information about it. And then we'll look at adding in a feature, which isn't in the error object, but instead we're going to inject this in and we'll show some source code around where that error is happening. And to accomplish this, we are going to be using a middleware. And again, this kind of error tracking is just touching the tip of the iceberg of what you really need in an error tracker. But it might be a good learning experience to see how this kind of thing is done. And it might give you some ideas of how you might implement a certain feature in your application. And did you know that you can go to railstore.com to get your own Ruby on Rails t-shirt or your Drift and Ruby t-shirt. So to start off, I'll create a new Rails application and I'm going to just call it the tracker example. And this will be our application where we create our web application that has an error. And then I'll create another application and I'll just call it the tracker app. And this is where we'll receive all the errors that are coming in from our tracker example application. And so to get started in our example application, I'm going to have a require and I'll need to create this folder, but I'll create it under the lib folder and I'll just call it the middlewares. And within there, I'll create a main.rb file. And this main.rb is simply going to require and load any of the middlewares that I'll have within that folder. And then within the application class, we can add the config.middleware.use and the name of the middleware that we're going to create is just called Capture Exceptions. And so that's all I'm going to do within this application other than creating the middleware. So under the lib folder, I'll create a new folder and I'll call it middlewares. And within here, I'll create a file and I'll call it main.rb. And the main.rb is going to be fairly simple because we just have one middleware. So we'll have a require relative and then the capture underscore exceptions dot rb so we'll also need to create this file and for the middlewares you really just need to have a class with the capture exceptions we'll have an initialize which will take in our app we'll set the instance variable app is equal to app and then you'll have a call function which just takes in an environment and if we wanted to we could just continue on with our normal behavior with the app dot call passing in the environment but for the purpose of this, we're wanting to capture the exception. So I'm going to wrap this call in a begin and then a rescue. And when we rescue, we could rescue from the exception, which is going to be a catch all for everything. However, that's typically not good practice. If you are going to implement this kind of error tracker in your application, you would have to determine if this is the proper route. But more often than not, you would want to rescue from the standard error. Just so I can use this error variable throughout the application, I'll create an exception and set it equal to the E variable. And then we can call raise E just to get back to our normal functionality of having Rails handle the errors. And one nice thing about this process, when you use the config middleware use, and then you insert in which middleware you want to use, when we talk about capturing exceptions, you do want to make sure that this is placed in the proper spot. So in our terminal, if we do a bin rails middleware, we'll get a list of all the middlewares that are getting used. And towards the bottom, we have our use capture exceptions. If you wanted this higher up in the chain, you could definitely do that. 
And the nice thing is, even though the exception is getting caught, we can still raise the error, so we're not changing the functionality. We're just inserting in a bit of code that we can then capture the exceptions. So I'll create a private method called capture exceptions, and I'll just pass in the environment. And so for the purpose of this application, I am just going to use a static URI. So I'm going to create a new URI, and I'm just going to send it to my local host, and we'll make it port 3001, since I already have this application running on port 3000. And then we'll just give it the endpoint, the record underscore exceptions. And because we are going to be using an HTTP post, I'm just going to require the library net HTTP, which is included with the Ruby core. However, if you're using a different mechanism, that's going to work just as fine as well. And one thing to note about this process that I'm not going to do is to put this call into a background job, which is something that you would likely want to do simply because you would not want the user experience to be interrupted if an error was caught, but then you had an error posting it to your error tracker. Instead, I'm just going to do a net HTTP post form and we'll post it to our URI. And then we can get some information about the error. We could get the message, which is going to be our exception dot message. We need the backtrace, which again is just the exception backtrace, but I don't want to send the entire backtrace. Instead, I just want to grab the first five or six lines and I'm going to join it with a new line character. And so this array of the backtrace items, I'm joining it with a new line, just so when we go to display it in the tracker application, it's going to display a bit more nicely. We also want to track the source location, which is going to be the snippet of code around where that error happened. And that's going to be quite a bit of work to get. So I'm just going to make that another private method that we'll just call the source location. If we want to get the method, we can get that from the environment and the request method. It might also be helpful to have the URI, which we can also get with the request underscore URL. And so getting the source location is a little bit messy. So in order to do that, let's first define our method and then we need to get the file. So we can get that file from the exception dot backtrace. We want to get the first line and the first line, we're going to split it with the colon because the first part is going to give us the file location. After the first colon, it is the line number. And then there's actually another colon where it'll say something like in index or whatever method that was called when the error occurred. And we don't care about that bit too much. So again, the first bit is going to be our file. And then the second item in this array is going to be the line number. So I'll clean this up a bit where we can have a source and that's just going to be our backtrace. And then we can have our file location. And that's just going to be the source and the first item in the array. And for the line number, we really want a start line number where we take our source and then the line number that's in the source, make sure it's an integer so we can do some math on it. And let's start with five lines before it. But the problem is, if we try to do this with a negative number, then we might have some issues. So if it's closer to the top of the file, then I want to start at the top or zero. So I can do an array here of the source line as an integer minus five, which might be a positive number or it could be negative, and then comma zero for the second item in this array. And I just want the max value of the two. And the end line, we're just going to have the source again, make sure it's an integer, and we'll just add five to it. And to get all the lines of our source location, I'll just create a final private method called lines. And then we could do a file dot read lines of the file location. And this will return an array. So in our source location now, we could just do a lines. We could do a start line. We can go up to the end line. And then we can just call dot join on there. And so in the welcome controller, I'm just going to have a raise where we have a hello world of errors. So when we start up our application and visit this page, we'll see that we get a runtime error. And so things are still working as we would expect. So now we need to switch over to the tracker app to consume this error. So under the config routes, I'll just create a resource for the record underscore exceptions. And we're only going to have the create action. 
And notice, we're not doing any kind of authentication here, which is just another example of this not being a full-fledged error tracker app. We're just going to consume in anything that we are posting to this. We'll then have a record exceptions controller, which is a class of record exceptions controller inheriting from the application controller. We'll have our create action. And so because I'm not going to set up a database for this, I'm just going to use it in memory. So I could do something like a rails.cache.write. The key that I want to use is the time.current. I'll just make this 2i, or if you needed something more granular, you do a 2f to capture the milliseconds. And then we're going to pass in some kind of payload. And because we don't need to return anything else, I'm just going to do a head OK. But the payload that we're just going to pass in, we'll just make it a hash. We'll have our message. And that's going to come from the params message. We'll then have a backtrace, which I'll also do from the params backtrace. We'll have our method, again for the params method, the URI, and then the source location. And we'll just make sure that we'll call to JSON on here, just so it gets cached nicely. And because we're doing this in a cache, if we look under the config environments development, we have caching disabled by default. So I'm just going to touch this caching dev file just to enable the caching, and I'm going to leave it as a memory store, which means every time I restart this application, it's going to also wipe out the memory, and we'll lose all that data. So if you do end up building something like this, you definitely want to make sure that you're persisting it to the database instead of in memory. And one other thing we need to do in this application is we need to have a skip before action, and we want to skip the verify authenticity token. And that's because we are not passing that into this application because the request is coming from a different application. And so we could go ahead and run our Rails application. But before we do, we would want to make sure that we come into the procfile.dev since I am on a Rails 7 application and we'll just bump the port number to 3001 just so we can have the tracker example application and this tracker app running at the same time. And with this running, we can come back to our web browser, refresh the page, then we can come back to our tracker application, and we see that we got the post. With the message of hello world of errors, we got the backtrace, we got the source location, we got the method, and the URI. And the URI is nil because we are at the root path of our application. And so now to display all of this information that we're getting in, it's going to be quite a bit. The main thing that we're going to do is the rails.cache.fetch just because I am storing this in the memory inside of a database. But the problem here is that we can't just do a fetch because the key that we created was a timestamp and there's no way for us to know what all the timestamps are. So instead of a fetch, I'm going to do an instance variable, get on here, and then I'll pass in the colon at data. And by doing this, we then get all of the information in the cache, we can get the keys, and then we can map through these. So the thing that I want to call on here is the rails.parse, and we want to parse the rails.cache.fetch, which we can now fetch the key because now we know what the key is, because we are mapping through all of the keys here. And if I wanted to, I can merge in the time of that key because it is just a timestamp, and then we can loot through each one of these. And so when we loot through each one of these, I'm just going to create some things like a strong for the method. And we can set this equal to the error and then the method. We can do the same thing for the URI as well as the time. But for the time, I'm going to do a time dot at, and then we'll pass in the error time. We'll call it as an integer and I'll divide it by a thousand to return it back to seconds. We could also get the backtrace which the backtrace is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to call raw here just so we can display out the HTML, but we'll get the error, the backtrace, we'll split it with these new lines and join it with a line break. And then we can display out the source location, which I'll wrap in some code blocks. We'll just call the source location. And the time is actually a symbol instead of a string. We can start up our application. We don't have any errors. We can come over, refresh the page to generate an error, come back, refresh, and then we have our error. So we have our backtrace, which is just limiting to the six lines. And then we have the source location where we can see where the error occurred. 
And if we wanted to make this look a little bit nicer, it's a lot to type in, so I'm just going to paste it in here. But the idea here is the same, where we just have our Rails cache instance variable get, we're looping through each one of the errors, and then we're just displaying it out. And then coming back and refreshing the page, we see our error, we can click on the accordion, we can get the information, the backtrace, and the source location. And as we add more errors, the tracker app will then see these errors, and we can just drill through them. And again, there is so much more that you would need to build in to make this a proper error tracker. So in most cases, I would recommend just using one that's already established. But this could also open up some ideas that you might have around your Rails application that might be suitable to be used in a middleware. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.